the Jewish channels we can review, criminality in the community, and rabbis writing on one criminal's behalf, hitting Broadway hard in April, and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now in this episode of the Week in Review. Hello, and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. Orthodox Jewish criminality is all over the headlines surrounding the recent Passover holiday. A rabbi famous for his association with celebrities and a high-flying lifestyle has pleaded guilty to bribery charges in Israel. Rabbi Yishayahu Yosef Pinto has been pictured with LeBron James and many other famous faces, but he'll now serve some time behind bars after his bribery scheme, which he'd engaged in to try to cover up another criminal activity, a fraud and embezzlement scheme at his charity that included the theft of millions of dollars in food donations that were meant for elderly and impoverished Holocaust survivors. Pinto has not been charged in that latter crime involving his charity, but just the bribery scheme to try to cover it up. And for the family of the man who had been the most prominent Orthodox Jewish elected official in the country, more arrests. A rabbi who is the son-in-law of the recently arrested New York politician Sheldon Silver has been himself arrested in an alleged $7 million Ponzi scheme. Marcelo Yair Trebich's alleged crimes are not alleged to have involved Silver. Among other things, Trebich taught a daily Talmud class. And then there's the crime that shook the Jewish charitable world, the stealing of an estimated $9 million from the Jewish poor in a mix of embezzlement and kickback schemes that has seen the jailing of a man who had been called the Prince of the Jews in the New York Times, former Metropolitan Council on Jewish Poverty CEO Willie Rapfogel. Rapfogel pleaded guilty, was sentenced, and made a partial financial restitution months ago. But investigative reporter Wayne Barrett obtained dozens of letters sent by Jewish leaders, including 19 rabbis, arguing on behalf of the man who stole those millions of dollars from the Jewish poor in his sentencing. Interestingly, the letters were not made part of the court record and were not voluntarily relinquished by either the court or the state attorney general's office. In an indication of the politically sensitive nature of the documents, Barrett had to file a freedom of information law request in order to obtain them. Among the marquee names in Jewish leadership who argued on Rap Vogel's behalf were the executive vice president of the Orthodox Union, Rabbi Stephen Weil, the president of the New York Board of Rabbis, Rabbi Joseph Potasnik, the leader of one of the most prominent modern Orthodox congregations and schools in the United States, Kehilath Jeshurun's and Ramaz's Rabbi Haskell Lukstein, the head of the kosher supervision operation at the Orthodox Union, Rabbi Menachem Ganak, and others. Political and organizational leaders who wrote on Rap Vogel's behalf include the executive vice chairman of the Conference of Presidents, Malcolm Holmline, chairman of the Claims Conference, Julius Berman, and the man who most prominently represents Jewish political interests in New York, CEO of the Jewish Community Relations Council of New York, Michael Miller. All the letters written by these and other Jewish leaders can be viewed at the website where the articles about them were published, cityandstateny.com. Moving on, April is Broadway's busiest month, and Meredith Gansman has previews of several shows in a segment from our theater show, Row J. What do a wedding, Shakespeare, and the opera have in common? You'll find all three of them in productions opening on Broadway in April. We have a sneak peek at the musicals It Should Have Been You, Something Rotten, and the play Living on Love. Let's start with the new Broadway musical It Should Have Been You. Broadway's Brooks Atkinson Theater sets the stage for a white wedding. Tyne Daly plays mother of the bride, Judy Steinberg. Sierra Bagas plays Rebecca Steinberg. And let's just say Daly's Jewish mom character may be less than thrilled that her nice Jewish daughter is marrying out of the tribe. But Sierra Bagas is completely thrilled to have Daly playing her mom. Time's wonderful. This is our second time getting to work together, and uh, it's very different, obviously. And um, yeah, you know, uh, Tyne is a force to be reckoned with. Anyways, you know, she's one of the greatest actresses, and I love getting to work with her so much. Uh, and yeah, as my mom, just we're always like, Mom, please don't embarrass us, please. Like, oh, uh, because she's just gonna say whatever she wants. She she thinks it, she'll say it. I don't know any Jewish mothers like that. <laughs> Exactly. David Burka plays Brian Howard. Burka recently got married to his longtime partner, Tony winner Neil Patrick Harris. He says his character is learning to combine families of two very different backgrounds. Easter eggs or matzo ball soup, what are you going to do? Both! Why not? Moving on to a new comedy romp, Living on Love tells the story of the over-the-top hilarious dramatics of the opera world. International opera star Renee Fleming is making her Broadway debut playing La Diva Raquel DeAngelis. The, the whole opera diva uh, is a character I've played since I was a student. We all play her and him and uh, she has an intercontinental accent and she's 
she is uh, a persona and she stands in a certain way and she moves in a certain way. She's used to, to really um, to being the center of attention. <laughs> I don't know why they thought of me, I really don't. <laughs> Jewish actor Douglas Sills plays DeAngelis' husband, Maestro Vito DeAngelis. And let's just say there's a lot of love coming just from Sills. <laughs> I see, I can only last so long without a little bit of her oh. taste in my... Ooh, on my neck. Don't give me a hickey. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Though he says working with a cast diva isn't easy. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. I think what people... talking about Trixie, right? That's right. Trixie and her understudy. All the bitches. Sill says Jewish culture has informed, or rather fed, his character. The key is a big appetite for life. Judaism is about living for the now and making the most of every day. And I think this character very much has a big appetite for all the gifts that God gives us. In the play, the DeAngelis is hire ghost writers, Robert Sampson and Iris Peabody, to pen their autobiographies. Jerry O'Connell plays Robert Sampson. First of all, shalom. O'Connell says that the play also provides some musical entertainment. La Diva Renee will be singing opera. Anna Klumsky plays Iris Peabody. Klumsky says opera can be very funny. It is big, and that's what can be so wonderful about it, and I think that's also what can be so funny about it. Finally, let's go back to the 90s, the 1590s, for the new musical Something Rotten. I've been telling my family that Something Rotten is a tap dancing rock and roll musical set in Elizabethan England, and they say, what? <laughs> He and his brother Nick are desperate aspiring playwrights competing with William Shakespeare. And yet it's about the theater today. It's all about competition. It's all about ambition. And although this new musical is shaping up to be something great, there are some rotten things that happen in the theater that these actors hope to avoid. People uh, texting in the theater. <laughs> Something Rotten opens April 22nd at the St. James Theater. Living on Love opens April 20th at the Long Acre. And It Should Have Been You opens April 14th at the Brooks Atkinson. To see more from Broadway's new offerings this spring, tune in to the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. Finally, this week on Up Close, the joy of discovery. We owe so much of what we know and think about our past and ourselves to archaeologists. Exploring what makes them tick and how hard it is to get their work done is Marilyn Johnson, author of Lives and Runes, Archaeologists and the Seductive Lure of Human Rubble. And then, artist Myra Kalman's work has been a joyous discovery for many. But the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum turned the tables by asking her to dip into their collection and reveal what she finds delightful. Her book from that adventure is My Favorite Things. Here are some of the highlights from my interview with Marilyn Johnson. I think a lot of us have ideas about what archaeology involves. Mm -hmm. uh, probably a lot of it informed by Indiana Jones. But people get around, they watch the History Channel, they go to tour sites. But I think there's still an idea that archaeology is something that, you know, you go into it, you study it, you get that career, but you find archaeologists have it really hard. Oh, yes. I think it's, I, you know, conceptually it's a difficult profession because, um, because it, it encompasses so much. I mean, it covers the entire world, uh, including the drowned world uh, and underneath the oceans and space, and it covers the entirety of human history. Um, so designing studies as scientists do and controlling sites and doing excavations um, take a variety of forms and require a tremendous range of skills. What you did here, you visited with a number of archaeologists, you went to a number of conferences, you went to a number of, of sites. Um, what really surprised you in terms of what you expected the archaeologist's life to be like and then what it ended up being? Well, it did surprise me that um, they were as hard-pressed as librarians to make a living. Um, but their sense of humor and their, I guess they're just wonderful people to hang out with because they know so much. And anybody who is uh, talking with passion about uh, work that they're doing you know, not just to, you know, get rich and buy another car and, you know, add to their music collection. I mean, these are people who care passionately about what they're doing. Right, and something 
that, that's kind of well known uh, broadly that an attempt to remove archaeological evidence has become increasingly yes. a part of warfare. It's, it's terrible. And, it's, and why does archaeology matter? I mean, in this country, this is a relatively new continent. This is our history is uh, relatively young compared to the rest of the world. We go into a part of the world in which people have been uh, living and leaving marks of their past for 30 centuries. I mean, that makes a huge difference. And that becomes part of people's identity in a way that I don't think Americans really can appreciate. Uh, so destroying you know, that history is uh, really an, a tactic that, um, that some modern warriors employ to all of our sorrow. <laughs> you can see the full episode of Up Close on the Jewish Channel on cable. You can also listen to the full audio of Up Close as a podcast available on iTunes or in your favorite podcast player. That's all for this week. From all of us here at the Jewish Channel, be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 1640, Iowa Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Cox Cable Channel 1, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, and on Comcast on the on-demand menu on the Channel. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.